Well, folks, it's uh, good to see you at the church again tonight as we've come together to worship God. Uh, we have a sense of His presence. We're going to sing our first hymn. Uh, it's really just explaining what we're doing tonight. That's Here I Am to Worship. It's recognizing that we've come into God's place and we're here to worship Him. That's the purpose of our visit tonight is to worship Him and give glory to Him. Let's stand as we worship. Let's all pray. Father, that's exactly why we've come here tonight. We are here to worship you, to tell you that you are our God. In other words, we know who you are, and we worship you for who you are, and we accept who we are, and we thank you what we've become in your Son. We are a new creation. The old is gone, behold the new. We thank you, Lord, that we worship you and we adore your name. We thank you that your character tells us that you enjoy the worship of your people. As we read your word, the Bible, really from the beginning you wanted your people to acknowledge who you are, to acknowledge who they were, and to worship you. So we worship you as the God of all creation. We worship you as the God who called out Israel to be your people. We worship you as the one who has chosen and sent your Son as the Messiah, the Christ. We worship you, for you are the one who has provided for us the Redeemer, the one who has redeemed us, who has forgiven us, who has given us new life, who has given to us your Holy Spirit. So we worship you as our God, and we worship you as your people. Accept the praise and the worship that we bring to you tonight as we sing, as we read, as we pray, and as we listen. Please accept our praise and our worship, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the most common ways that the people of Israel worshipped uh, when we read in the Psalms, 
and as we read uh, in the history of Israel, is that they shouted to the Lord. They shouted to the Lord not because God was deaf, although remember how that's uh, what Elijah said uh, to the prophets of Baal as, as, he, as an, uh, he set up his um, monument and his sacrifice. And the prophets of Baal, 400 of them, walked around their offering to their God. And they cried out to their God that God would answer them. And then they cut themselves because God didn't seem to answer. And Elijah was saying to them as they were walking around, is your God sleeping? Has your God gone off somewhere? Is your God deaf that he cannot hear you? And then when they were exhausted, the Bible tells us that Elijah prayed to God that God would come in his power. And immediately then the, the offering that was covered in water was burnt up and not even one drop of water was left. And so as the people cried to their foreign gods and the false gods, nothing happened. But we're called to call out and to shout upon God and God will always answer his people because God's a God who is intimately interested in you and he always answers the prayer of his people. So shout to the Lord, let's stand uh, as we worship. We're going to continue our study as we look at uh, Acts chapter 9, 10, and 11, and on to 12. And we're going to look at the reaction of God's people to what happened that we read about last week uh, when Peter went to Cornelius and Cornelius and, and all his friends who had come who were interested in God, how they gave their lives to Christ, how they became Christians. And we read how the Holy Spirit came upon them in such power. Peter goes back to Joppa to explain uh, to the, the Jewish Christians all what happened, hoping that they would be excited. And let's hear what God's got to say in, in Acts chapter 11, and we'll read from verse 1. This is God's Word. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the Word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and it was pulled up to heaven again. 
Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As it began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Amen. Let's all pray again. Father, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, that we are well and fit, that we're able to come here tonight to worship you. We thank you, Lord, there's no restrictions on us as Christians meeting together like this to to sing and to pray and to read and to study your word. We recognize that this is not possible for so many people throughout this world. Lord, we want to pray, first of all, for those folk who would normally be here but they're not well and they're not able to come here. We want to pray that you may touch them and heal them, restore them, Lord, that they may be back with us as we worship together as your people. We want to pray for our brothers and sisters throughout this world in many, many countries who are not able to meet together like this publicly, who can't meet and sing for fear of arrest. They can't even meet and pray together or read your word together for fear that their neighbors may hear. We thank you for your church in those countries. We thank you that you've called people out to be your people, despite what the government says and despite what the majority of the people say in those countries. We want to pray for safety for them. We want to pray for boldness for them. And we want to pray for wisdom for them. We thank you, Lord, that you're building your church And very often, Lord, we in the West can be so lazy about that. We take for granted our freedom of speech. We take for granted the the, the opportunities that you give us day and daily. And yet so many of our brothers and sisters would love the opportunities that come our way. Would love the opportunity to meet together publicly, to sing of your your character and and your grace and your love for others. They would love to be able to pray for others publicly and and, uh, they would love to read your scriptures and to witness. (coughs) But at the moment, they're not able to do that. So we pray, Lord, that you will give them wisdom as how best to read your word. How best to speak of your grace. And we pray that your church will continue to advance. And it's at times like that, Lord, we thank you that the advancement of your kingdom is not dependent on us or on our government or on freedom of speech. It's dependent on your Holy Spirit. For you will build your church. And we thank you that not even hell's gates can hold against, stand against it. And so we do pray that you will give grace and strength and courage to your people living in very, very difficult circumstances. And we pray for ourselves that we will not take this freedom for granted, but that we will use the opportunities that we have to speak of you. We will not be arrested, but people may laugh at us. Our families will not be taken away from us, but people may may walk away from us or, or avoid us. So we pray too that as a church that you will also give us wisdom as how best to share your good news. Knowing what to say, to speak the word in season and out of season. 
Lord, we recognize that doesn't mean we have to be a pain in the neck with people. It means we have to be sensitive to you, that we say the right sort of words at the right sort of time. And so, Lord, lead us again as your fellowship in this place. We pray again for our community here in Sydney. We pray, Lord, that the political leaders will have wisdom as how best to serve this community. Again, we pray for our police force. You'll keep them safe as they walk around and as they speak with people, as they investigate crime. We pray that you'll give them success. And we pray, Lord, that the light of your gospel will shine brightly from this church. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we come to consider uh, the, these words, we're going to sing again. And it's really reminding us to be still for the presence of the Lord. The Lord is here tonight, and he's here to speak to us and to minister to us. Let's be still for the presence of the Lord is here. Let's stand as we worship. Um. A number of years ago when I was studying at uh, Union, I uh, had to write lots of essays, but one of the essays that I remember writing was the question, are denominations uh, a blessing or a curse? And, uh, and in so many ways, we hear people talk about different denominations, and uh, very often you think, this is a real curse. Why can the church not be one? Why are there so many denominations? Uh, I've heard lots of people say, you know, in the Roman Catholic Church, there's no denominations, there's only one church. But you Protestants, you, you have lots of different churches, lots of different denominations. And that shows you that we are the true church because you just keep splitting all the time and you can't agree amongst yourself. And therefore, you're really not a church at all. First of all, that, that's not true what they say because although there is one Roman Catholic church, if you start to talk to various different churches and various different orders, you soon realize that there's many, many, many more denominations in the Roman Catholic Church, the Ram, the Protestant Church. Uh, all the orders that you have are, are all splits away from, from various other orders. And one order will actually detest another order. And, and that's why it was interesting that Pope Francis became Pope because the order that he belongs to, it always felt that Rome was too powerful. And, and they very often disagreed with Rome. 
and did their own thing. So it was very, very interesting when Pope Francis became Pope that, uh, that his particular order should actually uh, produce a Pope. They'd never produced a Pope before because they were always anti, anti-Rome in and, 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 and that sense. Um, and we have so many denominations, and, and lots of them actually are not of God, I think. I do think that, simply because denominations sometimes rise out of fights. One of the worst churches for fighting is the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. Uh, if you go to Scotland, you've got the Presbyterian Church in Scotland, you've got the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland, which is different from the Free. Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland is quite strange over here. I'll talk about that in a wee minute or two. But you've got the, the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, you've got the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland, you've got the United Free Presbyterian Church, you've got what you call the We Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland, and many, many more, actually. And they all came out of splits. They've all come out of where they disagreed over something, and they split off. And, and at the moment, actually, we, we are wa- watching and witnessing a split in the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. They could actually, uh, although I'm sure they said this about all the other splits, but this could actually destroy the church. Um, whenever the church split, before it was always very strong. Uh, the, the split that's happening now in the Church of Scotland is very, very sad, and actually could actually destroy the church eventually. And, and that split is over homosexuality uh, in the church. So churches have always split. And if you look in, in Northern Ireland, and I, I was in Market Hill before. I was good to see Bob Arley here this morning. Bob was the minister of Market Hill before I was. But in Market Hill, there's one congregation, but it's called First and Second Market Hill. It has two buildings, and that's because they joined together in 1918. But they split away back uh, in the early 1800s. And first was First Market Hill, and then Second Market Hill came about. And they actually split, First and Second Market Hill split over an issue in Scotland that had nothing to do, it was called the anti burger uh, dispute. And in Scotland there, there was an issue about who should call, who should call the minister. Uh, should it be the, 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 the alderman of the borough should call the minister? Or should it be the congregation that calls the minister? And this was very, very distinct and, and peculiar to Scotland. And yet churches over here split over that, over who should call the minister. We always called our minister, the congregations always called the minister in Northern Ireland, but many congregations in Northern Ireland split over that issue. And the churches in First and Second Market Hill split over that issue. And so you see lots of First, Second and Third churches. That's because they split over different issues at different times. Denominations first came about actually as a blessing because up until the Reformation, uh, you had what they called the divine right of kings, and that's why a whole country would be Protestant, or a whole, co- or, sorry, a whole country would be, oh, there would be Roman Catholic. If they were Christian at all, there would be Roman Catholic, and, um, and some Roman Catholic countries were more Roman Catholic than others, and that's why you always had conflict within Europe, uh, vying for power. And, and at the time of the Reformation then, whenever the churches became Protestant, what you found in Europe was the divine right of kings, and it was the king who decided what, what uh, church you belonged to. And so if the king was a Protestant, it was a Protestant nation. And if the king was a Roman Catholic, then it was a Roman Catholic nation. And that's why for a while um, Britain, or England in particular, uh, uh, changed from being Roman Catholic to, to Protestant, to Roman Catholic Protestant, depending on who was on the throne. And eventually then uh, it was a Protestant monarch that carried it on. And this went on for about 200 years uh, after the Reformation. Reformation starting really late 1400s, early 1500s, the very, very beginning of the Reformation. In the early 1700s then, you started having denominations and they were a great blessing. Because what happened was, if, if you were not the same uh, denomination as the king, then you'd be arrested and you'd put it in jail. Uh, and you, you could lose your life over it. And it was the early 1700s where they began to consider the idea, wait a minute, why, why can we not have Roman Catholic and Protestant uh, together in the same nation and allow people to choose? That, that, was, that was dramatic for folk to think about and to consider it. And all the kings and queens of Europe were against it because it actually diminished their power. And that's how it first started, that they allowed Roman Catholics and Protestants to together. And then whenever that was the case, Protestants then split up over various issues and, 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 and formed their own church. Because even when it was a Protestant church, they still persecuted Protestants who were not the, 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 the right kind of Protestant, if you like. Uh, in other words, what you then had, you had the Anglican church and you had the Presbyterian church and the Baptist church. 
And what you found that um, churches or the countries that were Protestant by the, by the king were actually Church of Ireland, or, or sorry, Church of England, Anglican, or they were Presbyterian, or they were, they were Baptist, or there was, really, there was never really a, a full country that was Baptist. And so the poor Baptists, no matter where they were always being persecuted, depending who was on uh, uh, the throne. And of course, we know that was the issue over here. Uh, again, if you go around the countries in, in, in Northern Ireland, uh, if you look where in villages, most uh, in the villages itself, most churches in the villages would be Church of Ireland. The Presbyterian Church tends to be outside the village or outside the town. And, uh, but I'm talking about the early churches in, in, in the late 1700s uh, and the early 1800s. They would be outside the town. So the, 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 the Church of Ireland would allow the Presbyterians to build but they had to build in a bad spot. They weren't allowed to build in the town itself. And when I first went to Market Hill, Market Hill is right in the center of the village. And, and that always confused me because Muller Brack, the, the, the Church of Ireland, is outside in a wee pokey place. And it's really not convenient at all. And I remember talking to the, the rector, uh, uh, Mr. Ferguson at the time, and I said to him, what's the story with this? He said, well, Danny, this is the most holy place in, in Market Hill. Uh, and the Roman Catholics had it, and we came in and we chased them, and, and we got that spot. And that's why we wanted this space, because it was a well-known holy place, and that's why we built out here. But when you consider it, we realized actually we built in the wrong place, because we should have built in the village where you guys built. And we allowed you to build there, because that wasn't a very holy place, uh, and that's why we let you build in, 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 in the village itself. And so denominations were, were a blessing initially, because it allowed you to worship God in, in, in the church that you, you felt comfortable with, whether it was Anglican, Presbyterian, or, or Baptist. And as time went on, you, you had lots of other uh, denominations. And, and many denominations that we have today are very recent, recent being maybe 100 years or maybe 150 years, really. Uh, but the three main denominations of Presbyterian, Baptist, and, and Anglican uh, has really come from uh, the Reformation. Anglican really has come from Lutheran in, in, in many, many ways. So denominations, good thing or bad thing, uh, a curse or a blessing. But denominations, whether you see them a curse or a blessing, is how strong you think of a denomination, I suppose. And tonight I want us to look at how do you cope when the church splits? Is a church splitting, is that a bad thing? Is it a good thing? And how should we stop a church that splits? Here was a possibility that the church would split. The church in Jerusalem had heard about Peter and they were fuming. They caught the news, they criticized Peter and they began then to consider actually getting rid of Peter. When they'd heard that he'd gone into a Gentile's house and had eaten with him, remember we looked at that last week, how you wouldn't go into a Gentile's house and you certainly wouldn't eat with him. In fact, even if you touched a Gentile, you were unclean because the, the, the salvation of the Old Testament, were, the way they saw it, which was wrong, the first century Christians saw the salvation for the Jews, were for the Jews and for the Jews only. That's not how God saw it. That's how God taught it in the Scriptures. God taught them that they were to be an example to the nations so that they may tell of who, this great God, the great God that they follow. But they didn't do that. They wanted God for themselves. And then this idea that God would save Gentiles they just couldn't imagine it. And here they'd heard then Peter, who was this great apostle, had gone into a Gentile's house. And so they call him back, he's in Joppa, and they call him back to Jerusalem to explain themselves. They're really cross with him and they're thinking, let's hear what he's got to say and then we'll, we'll, we'll probably kick him out. You can, hear, you can hear that in the sense of when they're talking. And tonight, just for a wee minute or two, I want us to look at this passage and think of, of how we should um, cope with conflict because conflict is always in the church. Where there's different individuals, there's always conflict. Of course there is. And uh, the only time there won't be conflict is when we get in heaven and we're perfect. But where there's misunderstanding, there'll be conflict. And here I think it tells us how we can recognize conflict and how we can keep it from actually splitting the church. Because very often when you split the church, sorry, I meant to mention the, the, the free Presbyterians. I should mention that before I go on. The free Presbyterian church has got nothing worse, now you know this, but it's got nothing to do with Presbyterianism. It hasn't even got to do with the doctrine of the Presbyterian church. 
because um, the man who set up the Free Presbyterian Church was never, ever interested in the doctrine of the Presbyterian Church. And, uh, but he took that name, and I think he took it for two reasons. I better not say why, just in case he gets cross with me. But there's two basic reasons why I think he took it, and none of them do with theology. None of them do with theology. And so when you think of the Free Presbyterian Church, it's not Presbyterian in, in, in church government, because he took the idea of moderator, but the idea of moderator in the Free Presbyterian Church is totally different from the moderator in the Presbyterian Church. Uh, the moderator in the Presbyterian Church really is only a, a figurehead. He has no power or authority at all. He, he leads, he chairs the, the General Assembly for one week in the year, that's all he does. And then after that, he goes around to uh, encourage uh, various churches. He has no authority to make decisions or, or, or to lead the church in that sense, but he's a figurehead, he's like a pastor head, uh, an encourager uh, to the church. That's not the same as the moderator in the Free Presbyterian Church. He's elected by the people for one year only, and he's not allowed to serve any more than that, and he steps down after that year. The moderator in the Free Presbyterian Church is more like a bishop, but I can understand why he didn't want to use the word bishop, and uh, that could be misunderstood, where he's elected for life, uh, and therefore that's why I think he was so really disappointed whenever he lost being moderator. And so the church government and the church theology is not Presbyterian, uh, and so therefore we have to wonder why he, they, they call themselves free Presbyterian when in doctrine and in church government that are not. And those are the two main reasons why you've got various denominations. Denominations uh, differ uh, over one or two reasons, uh, or both reasons. It can be the church um, theology is, is different. That's why Baptist churches are different from Presbyterian in both those ways. And, and in theology, they believe in, in, in adult baptism only, whereas Presbyterians believe in adult baptism and infant baptism, and that we're not exclusive uh, in, in baptism, whereas they are. And, the ch and they're different in, in, in uh, church government because we believe in a, in a Presbyterian type of government where it's ruled by elders uh, and, and ruled by uh, presbytery. And so there, 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 there's a sense of, of commitment and responsibility to one another. We're not congregational in the sense of that we stand on our own, whereas Baptist churches are congregational. They, they have no uh, direct link with any other congregation. They have no direct link to, uh, although they have a church house type place, they have no authority over them or, or no um, link with them at all. Uh, they're, they're congregational. And so in, in theology and in doctrine, they're different. And most churches are different in those two areas, theology and doctrine. And, and the Presbyterian, Free Presbyterian Church in, of, uh, in Northern Ireland here, or in, in Ireland, is, is different to the Presbyterian Church in doctrine, and it's different in, in church government. Whereas if you look at the Presbyterian churches in Scotland, but as I say, they keep splitting, and you've got the Presbyterian, the Free Presbyterian, United Free Presbyterian, the We, Pre we Free Presbyterian, they all have the same government, uh, and, and they have most of the same theology, but they, they differ on one or two areas only. Uh, and so in many ways, they, they, they look the same, and, uh, but in one issue or another, they've split away from the main church for a particular reason, but they want to still want to be Presbyterian. Uh, they still want to be Presbyterian in their theology, and they want to be Presbyterian in, in their uh, church government. And that's why they, they add a word or two to, to their church. So Free Presbyterian, United Free Presbyterian, non-subscribing. In fact, the non-subscribing Presbyterian is the only one that really shouldn't be Presbyterian. And we have that over here because their doctrine is different to the Presbyterian church and therefore they shouldn't really be called Presbyterian. But let's look then at this passage and we notice that there's three things that we can learn to help us from splitting uh, as a church and, uh, and causing conflict within church. The first thing we notice here is they were intent in falling out with Peter. You can hear it in their tone. Uh, they're, they're bringing Peter to tell him off that he should meet with Gentiles. And the first thing we notice in verses 4 to 10 is that uh, he, he tries to explain to them that he was intimate with God, that he was obeying God, he was hearing what God was saying, and therefore he had to obey God. You can, when, you, when you read this, again you read it, and how, he, how he felt about it, you know, he said, uh, when the sheep came down and I was asked to eat, he says, oh, I can't eat of that. I've never eaten anything unclean before. And so he's quick to explain that he was shocked when God asked him to do this. 
And the fact that God told him to do it three times, three is a very, very important number uh, in the Bible. And the fact that it's repeated three times uh, means it's very, very important uh, and he must obey it. And so he explains this to them that, that he's, he's closer with God. It was when he was praying, he fell into a trance and God spoke to him. And so he tries to say, look, I, I can understand how you feel here, but really I am convinced that God was speaking to me. And, and the way it all tied in made it obvious because as soon as uh, the sheep was taken away, these three men appeared. And therefore I knew it was right. And then I went to Cornelius. He was praying and he said an angel appeared to him and, and, and said, go to Joppa, to Simon the Tanner's house, and speak to a man called Simon, who is called Peter. And so what he's trying to explain, verses 4 to 10, is that he too was really surprised, but he was absolutely convinced that God was speaking to him. And so really what it does, it tells us that as we speak with one another and as we share with one another, it's important that we listen to one another. You know, we might have an idea about something, an idea of something that we thought we'd never do, but if someone comes and suggests that we should do it, we must never dismiss it offhand. We need to listen to what the person says. And if the person says, I've got a great idea, then we can dismiss it. Or I was over here and I heard these people tell me something, oh, that's a great idea, then we might dismiss it. But if the person tells us they've been praying and, and seeking God's face and they believe that this is right, now that's not an answer to say we'll do it, but it means that we listen to what he's still got to say. Because if the man or the person was praying and, and asking God for, for to speak to him and God speaks to that person, then it's important that we listen to hear what God is saying. And so when we talk with one another and people say something that we, we initially disagree with, we need to let them speak and then try and discuss whether this is right or not. And so they have an in, in, in intent of telling Peter off. They have an idea that they're not going to recognize this church of the Gentiles. But at least they have enough wit to listen to what Peter says. And Peter says, look, I was praying to God and, and God spoke to me. And God spoke to me in three different occasions about the, three, the same three things. He tells me to eat of these animals that are clean and unclean. And therefore, because we're clean and unclean together, we're all unclean. And we need to be people who are at least willing to hear what others have got to say. That we don't dismiss them just because of the domination they belong to. We don't dismiss them because we think their idea seems odd or, or strange. And we don't dismiss them because we actually don't like the idea what they first say. We need to listen to hear what they're saying and, 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 uh, and judge by what they say whether it's something that we want to consider or pray about rather than just dismissing it right away. For these folk were, were of a mind to dismiss Peter, but when they heard that he prayed, and he, they knew Peter, they knew Peter was to be a man of prayer, they knew that Peter was close to Christ, uh, they knew that Peter was, was leading the church for a while before James, and, and so they trusted Peter. And so when Peter said, look, I really was praying when God spoke to me, and I was surprised by what God said, then they hear him and they listen. And that's a lesson for us, that what we need to be doing is when we talk with one another and someone comes up with an idea that we're not quite sure about, let's listen to them. Listening doesn't mean we agree. Listening doesn't mean that we'll do it. Listening means we allow the person to speak and we ask the Lord to speak to us. But if this is right, then we'll do it. And if it's wrong, then we don't. But we don't just dismiss it because we've always dismissed it. If that was the case, then the church would have always dismissed the church uh, to the Gentiles. The second thing we read about in verses 12 to 15 is that we can keep conflict from splitting the church by following the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit, it's Christ who is the head of the church. And His Holy Spirit is sent into our hearts to lead us and to guide us. And the Holy Spirit will always lead us and guide us in the will of God. The Holy Spirit will never lead us away from God. He will never lead us in a way that dishonors God. He will always lead us according to God's will. And we need to be willing. Again, Peter picks this up when he's speaking. He, he uses it at each step. He says, look, the Lord spoke to me and I followed. The God spoke to me and I followed. Uh, God told him to go to Simon the Tanner's house and he was there. And while he was there, the Lord told him to go to Caesarea, uh, to Cornelius' home. 
and he went there. I'm sure when he went there, he was really nervous and, and, and confused. Uh, he'd never been in a Gentile's home before. He'd never eaten with a Gentile before, but he was obedient because he understood it was God he was speaking to. Him. And then when he saw the Holy Spirit descend on these people, and, and, uh, and they got up and, and they were truly saved, it was obvious that God was in this. And so he comes back and he says, all I did was follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And what we want to do in our church is do exactly the same. Whenever we feel there's conflict, and uh, I remember I was uh, in a church not too far away from here, and I was in it for two or three years. And whenever we met together, they actually had a, a common cupboard. It's not as big as ours. Ours is, ours is a big store. They had a wee cupboard. But various organizations used the cupboard. And every committee meeting, without fail, the first half hour was fighting over the cupboard and about the space they had in the cupboard. And, and it was a nightmare. They were fighting their own corner every time. And if they thought somebody had used an inch of their space, then they named and shamed them. And, and it went on every single month. Unfortunately, they had committee meetings every month. Thankfully, we don't have them every month. Yet, although we don't fight much in, in, in committee. And, uh, but you know, it was, it was hard work. And the organizations were always fighting their own corner. And you wonder what that's about. You know, whereas what we need to do as a congregation, because there's lots of opportunities for us to fall out, actually. There's lots of opportunities to have conflict, particularly now that we have lots of other organizations coming in. And it would be easy for us to fall out about lots of different issues. But we need to be following what the Holy Spirit tells us. We need to be aware that our mission is to speak out for Christ. And God has given us a lovely building, but he hasn't given us this building that we might worship. And thankfully, I mean, I was talking to folk again this morning. Um, Anna uh, was speaking to me. Anna is Jeff's wife, Jeff who played for us this morning. And she says, Danny, I love it when Jeff uh, is asked to play here. And I said, well, you should tell that to Jeff. And uh, maybe we'll play more often. And, uh, but she says, I love it because there's a real sense of unity and excitement when you come into Strand. Just love it. There was a girl from uh, Nightlight who I used to do Nightlight with, uh, and she brought a non-Christian friend. A non-Christian friend, she lives in uh, Lisbon, but a non-Christian friend lives in Hollywood. And she thought, I'll bring her along to Danny's church. And the two ladies said, your church is lovely, really, really nice, really enjoyed it. Uh, there's a real good atmosphere about this place. And lots of people coming in actually say that about us. That's important that we keep because what we will know now is that's what Satan will attack us with. He'll want us not to have a good atmosphere. You know yourself, you've gone into churches where you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. You're not sure what's going on, but you know that something's going on. Well, that doesn't seem to be the sense when people come in here. They have a sense of excitement. Uh, they have a sense of unity. Uh, they have a sense of, of that we're, we're, we know what we're doing. Thankfully, they don't know who we are, but never mind. But they have that real sense that there's, there's something going on in this place. And, 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 and they enjoy it and they like it. And, and those are, those are uh, a couple of folk who, who came in this morning. had never been in our church before. And they said, your church is so friendly. And there's a buzz about this place. And uh, it's really, really nice. And they enjoyed it for the sense of, of fellowship that we have in this place. And that's important that we keep. And, and we keep that by making sure that we're led by the Holy Spirit. And, and I'm sure I've said this before, but it's not the things that we do that are important. It's the way that we do it. Uh, we have lots of things going on here, um, lots of different things. And, and, but they could stop tomorrow and it wouldn't be a big deal because we'll start another pile of things. Because the things that we do are not important, but it's how we do it. We, we have all these classes and all these things so that we can befriend people, so that we can, we can be beside them and, and share with them who we are and what God has done for us. And, and we do that as we follow the Holy Spirit. And so we mustn't get worried if we think there's things that we're doing that we don't quite like. We mustn't be worried if we're thinking, well, there's other things we can do. Because it's dead easy to stop one thing and start another. So don't think because we're doing these things at the moment, we'll do them for eternity, because that's not the case. But we do want to do things that gives us opportunity to speak and to witness and to show love for Christ. And finally then, verses 16 to 18, we keep conflicts from splitting the church by submitting to the Word of God. When they heard Peter speak, <clears throat> initially they were wont to, to have nothing to do with these folk, but when they heard 
Peter speak, and he explains what God has done, they submit to it. And it tells us here that they're glad and they accept the church. And then the church is ready to go off. And this is where Peter takes, or Paul takes off after this point and really goes places. But this meeting was very important for them to recognize that this is what God is saying. And therefore their preconceived ideas of, of what God was doing and their preconceived ideas of what salvation was, that it was for the Jews only, they were willing to ditch those and follow the Word of God, follow what God says. And as a church, we will grow, uh, we will mature, we will glorify God as long as we continue to follow and submit ourselves to the Word of God. It's the Word of God that matters above anything else. The only reason we love being Presbyterian is because we believe that Presbyterianism uh, submits itself to the Word of God. The Word of God is our, our uh, standard and nothing else. That's the standard that we follow. And, and, and all the other confessions that we have uh, are under the Word of God. And what's true for the denomination is true for this congregation. The things that we do, not important, as long as we submit to the Word of God, as long as we recognize that this is what we are, this is who we are, and this is what we do. We glorify God, we witness for Him, we speak of Him, and we live holy lives so that people may see something of God in us. And therefore we do that, and you can only submit to the Word of God if you know the Word of God, of course, and, and, and that we read it and we ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Years ago when I first became a Christian, uh, someone said to me, you'll have to have a quiet time. And I thought, what on earth is a quiet time? I had no idea what they meant. And so I said to them, I don't know what that is. And they said, well, what are you doing in your quiet time? And I've asked them, what I was told way back in 1973, I continue actually today because I thought, that's really good advice. The first thing you do is you pray to God that the Bible reading that you're about to read, that God will help you understand it. And that what you'll do is you'll read it, you'll understand it, and then you'll try to think of how you can live it out. So that's what you pray. You pray, God, help me to understand what I'm about to read. Help me to be able to understand it in my life, what it means to me, and then help me to, to do it. And, and how do I go about doing it? And so that's what I pray, and then I read it, and then I think about those things. I think, well, what does it mean? And, and very often, particularly for ministers, the temptation is to think, how can I preach it? But how can I preach it and what does it mean can mean two different things at times. And so I need to always be saying, what does it mean? What does it mean for me? Not what does it mean for Strand or what does it mean for anybody else? When I'm reading it, I'm thinking, what does it mean to me? What, you know, what, what was God trying to say to me to me and then how do I live it out? And it's trying to submit to what God says because what God says is the most important thing. And if we all do that, then we will not have major conflicts. We will have disagreements at times. Disagreements are all right, actually. We, we read in the Bible that many, many people had disagreements. But it's when we cause it to split relationships, that's when it's sad. And because Peter explained to them that he was following the Word of God, and they themselves saw it as following the Word of God, then the major split didn't happen. And in fact, they blessed and thanked God for Cornelius and his family and his friends. And from then on in, the Gentile church was seen as part of the church. And there wasn't such a thing as a Jewish church and the Gentile church. It was together. And it was only when others came to try and bring that split about that we read about in Galatians and, and, and other books in the Bible that there's conflict. But the, but the Jerusalem church that represented the Jewish church wholeheartedly accepted the Gentile church, and there was no split. And we pray that over the next few weeks and months and years that lie ahead, we will not have major conflict in this church. And we won't have it as long as we stay close to God, as long as we're led and follow the Holy Spirit, and as long as we submit ourselves to the Word of God. We will see great things happen in this place. Let's pray together. Father, again, we thank you for your Word. Lord, your word is your word to us. So when you wrote it using the various people, you wrote it so that we might know you better, so that we may understand your will. 
And so through your Holy Spirit, you may apply it to our lives today. That's why your word is eternal. It's as valid today as it was written 2,000 years ago. The, the, the power of your word is as powerful today as it was then. So help us to be people of the word who read it. Help us to be close to you as we pray and help us to, to follow the leading of your Holy Spirit who wants to lead us each day. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As part of our worship tonight, we have opportunity to present to God our evening offerings. Our final hymn tonight is uh, a reminder that we stand in Christ alone. It's Christ who unites us, it's Christ who has saved us, and it's in Christ we stand. Let's all stand as we worship him.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us now and for always. Amen.